So uh, yeah, like I said, that's what we are, we're gonna talk about. So uh, I wanna start with, with, a, with a question. Uh, what is a server? Can anyone venture to tell me what they believe what a server is? It's okay. Uh, anyone online wants to guess or uh, give a, tell me what a server is? You can unmute yourself if you want to talk. Okay. So what is a server? A server is basically made up of two things a computer and a program. So the computer itself is a software, right? And then there's some there's a program you install on that computer that makes it a server, okay? So every computer is made up of two parts. You have the hardware, you have the software. The hardware is basically the, the thing you can touch, like the, the components of the computer itself. But once the computer is installed, what do you get? Uh, a server. What? No, not quite. Not quite. Once you have a hardware, I can use a computer. Right. It was just a hardware. Can you use it? Mm, yeah, you can. How? You can use it. Well, you can't. Okay. okay. So, hmm. Okay, what I'm gonna do, let's, uh, um, let me pause for a second. Let me pause for a bit of a second and uh, let's, yep, you do need a software too. Uh, give me one second. Uh, So before we start, I'm gonna play a video, okay? Just because um, based on what I'm getting, I'm gonna play a video. So you guys just watch this video and we'll go from there, okay? So this will give you a basic beginning, okay? Hello, my name is Mohamed Fofana. I'm founder and CEO of Amotech Training. We offer training Okay, so let me try. Is it choppy on your end? Let me see if I can. Learn about computers. But when it comes down to it, computers are really not that difficult to learn. And today I wanted to do just an introduction class just about computers and basically the major components in a computer. Okay, so let's dive in. So don't be scared of computers. know the core basics of a computer. Now, when we talk about computers, there are several types of computers. I know a lot of people think about this one I'm over here. This here is called a desktop. And basically a desktop monitor that stands in a keyboard and then you work with it. So this is one type of computer. Another type of computer is a laptop. So you can see here, I have a Chromebook and a laptop is another form of computer. Another computer we Deal a lot with our topics. <laughs> and finally, your phone. In this computer, you actually 
have a lot of familiarity with All of these devices we use are computers. Even now, the smart TVs that are coming out are basically like computers, okay? So that being said, I'm gonna introduce some parts that are in this desktop to better have you understand what are the parts that make up a computer, okay? So, this is open up. So, is this big piece that's in here where all these things attach. So the first thing you notice inside of a computer is like the mother, right? Like the mother of a family kind of gets everyone together. So it's important as that unit for everything that the computer needs is connected, right? So the, the memory, all of this part has to be installed on the motherboard so they can. And this is how everything works your cell phone, your laptop, they all have that. Of course, they all have that feature, that motherboard, that thing that everything is installed on. Okay? So that's the first part of a computer you want to learn the motherboard. Okay? Next critical thing is, uh, is in the back here. The back here, this is the power pack. This thing, you have the fan, and you have the, this is your power pack. Now, if, when you take it out of the computer, this is what it looks like. You can see here, this is where you plug the power to go out to the outlet when you're in your house or your office. And this here gets connected to the motherboard and other parts to give it power. So this is the power pack, power bank, okay? All these devices have some type of power pack on them. Again, this is big because it's for a big desktop. The laptop has it, the tablets have some type of power pack that powers the unit. So this is what that is, right? The next thing hard drives. This one is a hard drive that comes on a desktop like this. It's a bit bigger. And this is the hard drive that goes onto a laptop. It's smaller, so it fits in a laptop. Now, the hard drive job is to save and store information. It's just storage. When you download your music, when you download your, your files, anything that you need to save on your computer gets saved here on the hard drive. So the hard drive is known as storage, permanent storage, because what gets saved there will stay there until you delete it. So music files, pictures, videos, your documents, they all get saved on so it's so you know what uh we have like choppy uh i don't know what's going on so we, it's a bit choppy so we've seen some issues with uh the video so what i'm gonna do uh in in, in that case i'm just going to explain a few things to you guys right so um and what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to use a whiteboard to kind of um, to kind of um, share with you some stuff. So, um, so a computer has a three parts in a computer that I want you guys to be mindful of. Okay, so uh, those three parts are number one, you have what's called um, the hard drive, hard drive hd and the hard drive is a permanent storage so on your computer there are three things that are critical they have other parts but the three things i want you guys to be confident with is number one the hard drive the hard drive is what known as permanent storage permanent storage means what everything you want to save gets saved there until you want to delete it so that means like your pictures your um, your videos, your Word documents, all of these things, they get stored in the hard drive. Files, files, data. So it's any type of data you need to store. And what's data? Data can be anything. It can be your uh, your music file. That's data. Your your Word document. Your 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 presentation. Your 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 videos. All of these uh, need to be stored somewhere. 
right? And that's the hard drive dog. It's, it's, it's permanent storage. The second part I want you guys to be mindful of is called the processor, P, right? And the processor is basically the brain of the computer. The processor is the brain of the computer. The reason why that being said is it processes all the requests that you want uh, the computer to do. So uh, if you guys notice sometimes when your computer is working really hard, it gets hot. You can feel a hot air blowing, right? Mm -hmm. That heat is coming from the processor. The processor itself emits a lot of heat. So um, because it's doing a lot of work. And what happens is there's a fan there's a, um, that's blowing out the air. Like air yeah, or else it's going to fry. So that's why when your computer is really under stress, you see that fan blowing that out of air. So the processor is the brain of your computer. It does all the work. So when you want to, when you click things, play a music or play a movie or open a particular Word document, who's making all those commands? Who's making all those requests? It's the processor. So the processor does all, all of that work. Okay, so the processor is the brain of the computer. And then the third one you need to know is the RAM, R-A-M. And RAM stands for random access memory. Random access memory is your, um, is the, the, this is where you do all your work. So that, this is where you do all your work. So the random access memory acts as what's called temporary storage. Again, what did I say was the permanent storage? Hard drive. Hard drive. The hard drive is your permanent storage, right? And, um, but the RAM itself is temporary storage. Why do I say that? This processor only does work in files that are open inside of the RAM. So everything that gets stored here permanently in the hard drive, before you can start processing and doing work, it's gonna take it the file from the hard drive, it's gonna put it inside of the RAM because the, the hard drive is permanent storage, but the RAM is temporary storage. So let's say you wanna watch a movie. Where is the movie stored? Oh, in the, the movie is stored in the file, but which one of these three, where is it stored? RAM, no, permanent. Yeah, so when you download a file, it's gonna be stored in a hard drive because the hard drive is permanent. When you go and download, you download anything, it's gonna download it and store it permanently on your hard drive. But when you wanna open, you wanna watch that movie, it's gonna take it from the hard drive, it's gonna dump it in the RAM. So in fact, this presentation I'm doing, the stuff I'm, I'm working on, this is actually open inside of the RAM. So, this is why if your computer has a small RAM, you cannot open too many things, it's gonna be slow. Why? Because uh, it's gonna open all your programs inside of the RAM, right? Mm -hmm. So how do that, oh, so here's, let me, let me show you guys. So let's say this is your hard drive, right? HD, right? And then this is your RAM. Let's say you want to watch a movie. The movie is stored here. This is the movie file, mm -hmm. right? What happens is when you want to watch that movie, this movie here is going to get open inside of the RAM. And now that it's open inside of the RAM, the processor can only do work from what's open inside of that RAM, right? So let's say you want to open a movie file. So this is open. Then Later, let's say you also want to open several files. You want to open a Microsoft Word document, right? That also gets open here, right? So now the RAM is getting full, right? Let's say you want to open Facebook app. That gets open here, right? So all of these things are being open here. So if you have a small RAM, can it all, just to compare if you have a big RAM, this is four gig of RAM and compare it to two gig of RAM. Two gig of RAM is small. So you open two programs, it's already full. So what happens is whenever you want to open another program, it's going to start swapping programs. Like take this out because it doesn't have space. So this is what makes your computer slow because it doesn't have enough big RAM to hold everything in. But when your RAM is big, it can 
keep putting as much as you want in there and then the processor can keep going back and forth without any problem but if it's full it has to take something out to bring something in does that make sense any questions so the ram that's why it's called temporary storage because the permanent so when you do work here when you hit save it's going to make those save those changes permanently in the hard drive so the hard drive is permanent storage the RAM is temporary storage. This is why sometimes you can have a computer that has a lot of RAM. I mean, a lot of hard drive, like 500 gig, a terabyte. But if the RAM is small, it's still gonna be a little bit slow because it doesn't, it's like, it doesn't have enough space to put all the programs to open the programs. So whenever you have several, this is why when you have a computer that has a small RAM, when you start opening a lot of programs, it gets slow because it can't handle it. It has to keep swapping back and forth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, the key thing is the processor only does work inside of the RAM. So when you open a file, let's say you want to open Microsoft Word inside, that Microsoft Word program is going to get open inside of the RAM. And as you type in and doing all the requests, the processor is doing all of those requests for you. But it's only going to do it when things are inside the RAM. And after that work is done, it will save it back to permanent storage. So here's how I remember, here's the easiest way to remember um, these three parts. So you have the hard drive, the RAM, and the processor. So the RAM and the processor are like brilliant professors. They can do all type of calculations, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the processor is the one that's actually doing the, the, the work, but it's doing it inside of the RAM. Mm -hmm. So these two guys are like brilliant professors. They can do all type of crazy work, but they have a problem. Every time they go to sleep, they forget everything they've worked on. Mm -hmm. Right? So, the, because what happens is once you turn off your computer, everything that's inside of the RAM gets wiped out. This is one of the reasons whenever your computer is acting slow or your phone is slow, what did they tell you? Turn it off, turn it back on, because what's going to happen is going to wipe out all the programs that have opened inside of the RAM and wipe it out. Right? So, they are brilliant professors, but they have amnesia. Whenever they go to sleep, whenever you turn them off, they forget everything. Right? So the hard drive is the great assistant that's always write down what they've done. So when they get back, it says, hey guys, this is where we left off. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. This is how, you know, I try to make sense of all these three parts. So the hard drive is permanent storage, which is storing all the permanent work these guys are doing. And the RAM is the area where the processor does its work. And basically, in any computer, these are the key parts of the computer. And this is what actually tells you how expensive your computer is going to be. So if you get a Chromebook, it's going to have a little bit of RAM, like 2 gig or something like that, right? But the processor, too, is going to be very slow. The processor is one of the most expensive parts of a computer. Why? It's the brain of the computer. It's the thing that's doing everything, right? So if you buy the top processors, are like you heard of Pentium 7. I mean, um, i7, yeah. i7 is actually one of the fastest um, um, processors. You also have i5, you have i3, whoops, you have i3, you have i3, which is also a, a pretty good um, a, a processor, right? Now, when you get a Chromebook, you get a small processor. And what happens is a cheaper processor is like having a, let's say it's like, it's like having a, okay, let's take it as an example. You have a, you guys watch soccer or football. So some of the Chromebooks, the processors on them are like a high school football player, okay. like a high school soccer player, mm -hmm. right? But compared to that to like a Messi or Ronaldo, yeah. the thing the high school guy can do, he can do it, but he, he cannot do it as fast as, 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 as uh, you know, as professional as the, the, the professional athlete. So when you buy a cheaper computer that has a, a weak processor, it, it will process things, but it will take, it will take some time. Yeah. And some stuff that's really, really hard, some skills, it won't be able to do it. That's why when you buy a cheap computer, not all programs can get installed. If you have a, a program that's very complicated, like uh, 
virtual machines or virtual intelligence programs, right? You need a processor that can actually handle those requests. So this is the difference between a $100 computer and a $2,000, $3,000 computer. One main thing is the processor. The amount of work, the amount of lifting the processor can do dictates. So when you buy a computer, these are the things you want to look for. You want to look, do I have enough storage, permanent storage, hard drive? Is it 500 gig? Is it a, a, a terabyte? Now, storage, permanent storage is pretty cheap. It's one of the cheapest things, right? Because storage technology has gotten so better, so good that um, storage is becoming very, very cheap, yeah. right? RAM also is also getting cheaper as technology improves, but the RAM, so now you have computers that have 16 gig of RAM, 32 gig of RAM, you know, mm -hmm. uh, instead of just four. Most computers now come with at least four gig of RAM, right? Which is okay, but the computer that have a 16 gig of RAM or 32 gig of RAM can be way more because you can store more things inside of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then if you have a big storage, but your processor is weak, you can have all this information in the storage, but the yeah. processor cannot handle it, yeah. cannot process it fast enough. Yeah. So what's gonna happen? Your computer is still gonna be slow. But if you have a, enough RAM and a powerful processor, guess what? Your computer is gonna be way faster than somebody else's that doesn't have it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So any questions? Any questions so far? Uh, so that's basically how, um, basically what I've gone through is the, what? This is what's called the hard drive, the, um, this is all part of the hard drive, right? Why do I call it hard drive? I call it hard drive because, because, uh, let me share. Again. I call it hard drive because these are all physical components. These are things that you can touch. They're all inside the computer, right? So it's hard drive. So that's one component of a computer. So you have hard, hardware, sorry, hardware. So the hardware, the key things I want you guys to learn about hardware is the RAM, which stands for random access memory, the hard drive, which is a permanent storage. Um, and then you have the processor. So these are some of the key components of hardware. Again, hardware is the part of the computer you can physically touch. So now, these alone cannot, um, don't, you cannot use a computer, right? If you have just hardware, can you use, is the computer functional? No. no, it can just come in, but you cannot use it right. because it needs another part. So you have the hardware and then you have the software. So the software is the second part of a computer. Right? So the software, all the software is, is just a program. It's a program, a set of instructions. So software is just a program. And all a program is a set of instructions. It says, do this, that, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, but isn't uh, the processor is a hard drive, is it the hardware? It's a hardware, the processor is a hardware. These are all physical things you put in a computer. I'll send you guys the link of that video that was choppy. Okay. So you guys can watch it on YouTube and it, it would, um, it, you know, you, would, you see exactly what they look like and how they are. I was playing it, but it kept breaking up. So that's why I said, let me just explain it. Um, but I'll send you guys, I'll post that link. Um, I'll send that link to you guys. So you guys can watch that video on your own. But the, so the hardware are those. The software now is, the program that you install inside of the computer. And what do you think you install that software? What part of the hardware do you install it on? The uh, hard drive. The hard drive, why? Because it's permanent storage, storage, right? So the, the software gets installed on the hardware, on hard drive, right? So there are two types of software. You have a OS, which stands for operating system operating system. So the operating system is a software that interacts with the hardware. So the software, what, what's one of the most popular software that's been used? Windows. Windows. What's another software? 
OS. What's another OS? Operating system. Vista. Huh? Vista. That's all part of Microsoft. Oh, okay. That's Windows. Ma Vista. Ma What's Mac? another operating Mac? system? What's Mac? that? Mac. 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 iOS. iOS. That's iOS. That's a Mac. Okay. And then there's another one you guys, some of you haven't heard of. It's Linux. L-I-N-U-X. Linux. So Linux, this one, 95% of the computers in this world out there use Windows. And for the people that have money, you have about 3 to 4% that use Mac, iOS. Right? And then the rest use Linux. But Linux is not used well in regular computers because it's called a command line. You, 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 it's, it's a command line software. So you don't, you don't use it much. But in IT, when you're in the IT field, you see Linux a lot. Okay? So just so these are some of the operating system. The operating system, what is the operating system? You said there are two program. types of programs. You said there are two types of software. One okay. is operating system and one is... The other one is the application. application. It's an application. But I'll get to that in a bit, okay? So the other one is application. Whoops. So application is the other one. But so first, let's just be clear. The operating system, what is the operating system? The operating system is a software, is a translator between you, the human being, and the hardware. So one thing people don't understand is computers talk with what? They, call, they talk in binary. Computer talk, they talk to each other in something called zeros and ones. Okay? Computer talk in zeros and one. And this is called binary. Binary, right? But we humans don't talk in binary. We speak whatever language, French, English, German, whatever, right? So, so this is your hardware. This is you you the user, right? Mm -hmm. This guy talks in zeros and one, we speak our language, right? So the software is what you install on the hardware that becomes the interpreter okay. between you and the computer. So you give instructions to the operating system and the operating system tells the hardware what you want it to do and it goes back and forth. Does that make sense? This is how I kind of, IT is not difficult. Just make it to something that you use normal, right? So I see the hardware as those things we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but we cannot talk because they talk in binary. We cannot talk to them. So what is the translator? You need a middle person, mm -hmm. right? So if somebody speaks English and the other person speaks Chinese, you need an interpreter, somebody in the middle who can, or else yeah. you guys are not going to talk to each other. <laughs> so the operating system is that middle person, the interpreter between you and the hardware, they communicate, correct? Mm -hmm. So, and in the operating system, what are some of the software that are out there? Windows, Windows iOS, iOS Linux. Linux. And there's one you guys have used, but you don't think about as a operating system. And that's Android. Oh, yeah. Android. And uh, who owns Android? You can tell me. Anyone want to guess who, what company owns Android? Google. It's owned by Google. Google. Wow. Yep. It's owned by Google. Google owns Android. Okay. So in the Android world, I mean, in the operating system world, there are two types of operating systems. You have ones called open source, and then you have another one called closed source. Open source operating systems are Linux, and Android. 
the closed source operating systems are Windows and iOS. These are examples of open source and closed source. These are all operating systems. So what is the difference between an open source and a closed source? Open source operating systems means the code, the program, the program that's, that runs the computer. Because all the operating system is the operating system OS is what runs the computer, what runs the hardware, right? It's the middle person. that It's the one that gives the instruction how to run. So you have all of these within the operating system. You have open source and closed source. Open source means the code, the program is available to the public. You can, so if you know what you're doing, you can take it and customize it to you for your usage. But closed source means, closed source, you, you're not allowed, the code is not available to you and you're not allowed to change or modify the code. So Windows, Windows says when you install, remember every time you try to download it, you see those things you signed that agreement saying, those long things you never read, you basically agree that you're not gonna modify, you're not gonna mess around with it. You're only gonna use the program as you install it. So Microsoft, you sign those off. Windows, you gotta sign that off. They're saying you cannot, you cannot mess around with the code because it's owned by this company. They don't want you to mess with it. So Linux and Android on the other hand, even though Android is owned by Google, but Google made the code available so developers can play around with the codes for them for, for them to for to fit their own environment. And so when in fact when Google acquired Android, they had a choice. Do we make it closed source or do we make it open source? They wanted more people to be using their platform. So they made it open source. This is why when you have an Android, uh, you have an Android application, the apps they have way more apps in Android than you have in iOS. Yeah. Because this is one of the reasons they want it to be the dominant platform that people use so they made it open source apple in the other one apple wants to control everything so they're like nope you're only going to develop based on our platform and you we're not going to give you the code we don't want you to mess around with the code does that make sense yeah. microsoft this is the difference between open source and closed source now what's the good what's the bad about open source and closed source who can tell me what's bad about open source That's what people think. No, but not quite. Okay. Who can tell me what they what what could be an issue with an open source software? Come on, folks. Anyone online? Guess. You know, there's no wrong answer. I need participation from you folks. Maybe not enough room. Uh, so somebody says security. Uh, okay, uh, not quite. Funnily enough, security is one of the good things with some of the open source. Uh, what happens with open source is one of the bad thing about open source is support. If the software, the code is available to anyone and somebody develops the code and then use their operating, their operating system. If something goes wrong, can you get, how do you get help? That person may not be available. That company may be hard to find how to help you. But in a closed source, if Microsoft has a problem, you know exactly who to contact. So support is a big problem with open source because, because everyone has their own version. The code is available to you. If you're a developer, you say, you know what? I'm going to make my software operating system look like this. And then the next person, and so there's so many versions of Linux out there. There's so many, you know, but getting support could be a problem, right? But in, in Windows and iOS, you know exactly who to reach out to and they will say, hey, there's a problem here and they, they, they can help you. Right. So support is a big thing uh, in the closed source as to open source. Now, the advantage of open source is security. It has good security, why? The code is available to the public. So if you have a bunch of pe um, um, people looking at the code, right? Are they more than likely to find security problems? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So oh, because of, uh, everybody everyone is involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have like the whole community 
that it's at that they check in it so if there's a vulnerability they're like hey we have a problem here mm-hmm. so you have but for a company you have limited resources microsoft only has so many people they can put to work mm-hmm. on on this issue or to work on security so they have limited resources based on their company where open source will have like the whole yeah, world so many different issues, issues. Oh, okay that's cool so security is actually a good thing with some of the open source where you have people policing it what are um any questions so far yeah is that always an acronym huh yeah i uh yeah they it's i don't even have it off it but that's they call it ios um operating system um I forgot what the I stand for, but is that, is that where Apple is classified? Apple. Yeah, this is Apple software. They, 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 uh, Apple yeah. software, they call it iOS. Oh, okay. Yeah, so Apple, yeah, the operating system, they call it iOS. Okay. Where Windows, Microsoft Windows, you have Windows. Windows is owned by Microsoft, right? iOS is owned by Apple. So, the, you know, so if you just say Apple, that's not the operating system. The Apple, the operating system name is iOS. Apple uses iOS. And um, Linux and Android, that's why your iPhone uses iOS. <laughs> Android uses uh, the Google uses Android, so that's the platform, and that's why Android is open source. That's why you can have the same um software on what? Um, laptop, Microsoft too is is closed source, but you can also have it on different things, yeah. right? So because Android is open source, that's why you can have a different companies yeah. can Samsung can install iOS on the, yeah. um, Android on their phones. Um, LG, whatever. And this is one of the reasons why Android is so popular. And this is how Microsoft was able to dominate the market too. Microsoft said, look, any, we don't care who your manufacturer is. You, you, allow, you can install our operating system on your computer. And then we just take a small percentage of whenever you make sales. That's what they did with, uh, with uh, game systems like Xbox. Xbox is connected with Microsoft. And that's how we're able to reach our territory. So again, it's um, it's, that, that's the thing. So when businesses are making this decision, they have to decide how we're going to make our money, right? Android, Google says, we're going to open our platform. We're going to make it open source. But as developers are developing, guess what? Our own products will also be used more. YouTube, Google Maps, Google Chrome, all of these other Google products that they have, come with it and people use it and they like, so that's how they, they decided to make it open source. Okay, so we clear what open systems are. Okay, now, can we use a computer? Is a computer usable with just the operating system? Not quite. Now, all it means that now you have a translator between the hardware and you, they're trying to use a computer. So the computer has an operating system, but can you use it? Think about your phone. When you have your phone, what do you need, what do you need to start installing on it? Uh, Play Store? What, what's, the, what's in the Play Store? Uh, 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 an app. Apps. Apps, short for applications. Applications is now what makes your computer usable. You know, what's, so what's, when you get your computer, what's one of the first app? Let's say it's a Windows computer. What's one of the first applications you're gonna install? Microsoft mm-hmm. Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, the Microsoft mm-hmm. Office yeah, Microsoft software, yeah. right? And that's just has a bunch of different applications you can use. Microsoft Word to type a paper, write up a paper. PowerPoint to do a presentation like I'm doing. Excel, Excel to, these are all individual applications that you can use. Now your computer is usable. You can install, of Facebook, whatever application that you want on top of the operating system. When you look at uh, Apple iOS, let's say WhatsApp, and for Apple iOS and for Android, it looks, they're not quite the same, right? Because you have to have the, the software, the operating system first, and then you build the applications on top of it. Yep. So that's why on the hardware side, you have the RAM processor and hard drive, right? Then on the software side, what do you have? You have two types of software. You have the OS, which is the operating system, which is the middleman, the translator between you, the user, and the, and the hardware, and then the application, which is actually things you're using. 
So folks, this is basically all what the computer is. And the same technology applies for a desktop, laptop, laptop tablet, tablet, smartphones, even some of the smart TVs. It's the same technology. Any questions? Okay, so now that we've explained that, right? So the PC, you have PC, right? A PC is what? Personal computer. So all a PC is, is a personal computer, right? So, uh, so you have a, and why is it personal computer? It's for you to use. It's your own personal computer. Do you, does you, do you keep your laptop up 24 hours a day? You use it and then you turn it off. What happens if your computer is always, your laptop is always on? Is it gonna last two years? It's gonna start burning out. Things are gonna break because they're made to be used and turned off. Personal computer. And also it's personal because maybe you may want Microsoft Word and PowerPoint, but the other person just from Microsoft Word, I'm not gonna use PowerPoint. Everyone installs what they want on their PC. Does that make sense? So keep that in mind as we talk about what I what I, what my uh, the, what I was talking about earlier. Okay, so are we clear as far as what a yeah. what a computer is, right? Okay. So now I'm gonna go back to the presentation I started with as far as what a server is, right? So this now should make more sense. So what's the hardware, folks? The hardware is what the processor, hard drive. Processor, processor RAM. hardware, and RAM. Those are the key, those are some of the key components in a computer system, right? Now you follow that. So what a server is, a server is basically a computer and a program. Remember I told you guys the program is? is a software. So the two of them combined creates what's called a server. So it's both. So sometimes when I ask this question, is it a hardware or software? A server, is it a server, a hardware or software? The answer is it's both. It's both the computer itself and a software that goes on that computer that makes it a server. So there are different type of servers. You've seen this guy, a tower server, it looks like a regular desktop. A tower server is a freestanding unit, similar to your large desktop PC in both size and shape. So this is what a tower server looks like. Then you have a server called a rack. Uh, we'll yeah, yeah, you guys will, we, I'll, I'll send you guys see link to this um to this slide so you have a rack a rack server is specially designed to fit within a standardized 19 inch mount rack and you see it it's flat mm -hmm. so you can just slide them in uh they have like rack it's, it, it's in like it's like a shoe rack yeah. but it's very thin you can just slide each one so each one of these is a full server and you can stack them and i'll explain a little bit why that's important Okay, then you have a blade server. A blade server is a, a server for use in blade enclosed design. So you see how the blade servers, they're similar to a rack, but you can, they're going, up, they're going they're yeah. So these are just, again, for you to kind of know what, it, so when you see a server, you know what it look like, yeah. okay? Now, a typical example of a server, a server can be anything. Your laptop, your desktop can become a server. It's just a computer that has a particular program. So for example, let's take your PC, your desktop, right? Or laptop. It has like Windows, Microsoft Windows operating system on it. Now, you once you install, there's an application called Apache software. Once you install this Apache software, Guess what you now have? 
you've now created what's called a web server. Remember I told you guys, a server is the hardware and you install a particular program on it becomes a server. So if you have a computer and you install Apache, which is the program on it, you now have that computer can now become what's called a web server. And what's a web server does? A web server does what? It, nope. It allows you to build a website oh, on it. Okay. So people can come there. So when you when you come to when you go to google.com, right? Or you go to amazon.com. That what you go on is you're accessing their server, their web server. Because whatever computer they have in the back end has this Apache program installed on it. So now they can build a website. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, now when you talk about a server, there are two things you gotta, there are two things that come to mind. You have a client and a server. The client is the computer that's making a request. The server is the computer that's granting you access to certain things. That's exactly what it's like. It's like a server, right? A server is like a restaurant. You go to the restaurant, you're like, you know what? Uh, I want some, some chicken, some lemonade. You ask for what you want, right? And the waiter, the server goes, you're the client. You don't want making a request what you want. And the waiter or the server goes and gives you what you want. And that's the thing about IT. A lot of the terminologies that are associated with IT are things that we, we've used in regular life, but they've converted to a computer. So a server means I'm serving you. You make a request and I give it to you. Can one or more, can more than one person make a request to a server? Yes. And the server will give you if it has it. If you go to a Chinese restaurant, you order Chinese food, you get Chinese food. But if you go there and order uh, American food, they're like, oh, we don't serve that here. So that's what a server is. The servers can be built for different things based on what you want. So the first one I just showed you is a web server, right? A web server allows you to do what? Build a website on top of it. That's it. Now, if you want to go do something else, you need to do what? Install another program that allows you to do that. So you can see here, we built a web server. So this computer, they're all computers, right? All of them are computers. But this computer here that's been installed with the Apache is what's known as the web server. And then I'm home, you, this other guy is home and you are home. And we all want to go to imotechtraining.com. Who are we? With a client, because you want to, you go type www.imotech.com. You're now saying, hey, I want to request access to your yes, server. So we're making a request to this middle guy. And that guy in the return does what? It now services our request. It allows us to go to that website. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, remember I told you guys the different type of servers, right? What's the first server we just learned about? What's the, what's the type of server we just learned about? What's the name of the server we just learned about? Oh. That's a type. What's the server? The web server. Web server. We just learned about a web server. And a web server does allows you to do what? It allows you to do what? What does a web server allow you to do? To build a website. And for you to build a website, what do you have to install on that computer? What program do you have to install? Apache. Apache. See? Yep. So you have a computer. You install Apache on it, makes it that computer now becomes a web server. 
I can now go and build a website on that computer and people can come to it. And you can do this on any computer. But remember, do you want to go build a web server on your personal computer? Yes or no? Is that, is that a good idea? Do you want to build a web server on your personal computer on your laptop? Uh, is that a good idea? No, I think it's best on desktop. Yes, okay. Not a good idea to do on your laptop. It's also not a good idea to do it on a desktop, even though you, you can do it. The reason why is because you don't have um I mean an echo. It's because you don't have uh, access to uh, um Personal computers are not made to be on all the time, are they? No. And if you have a web server, it needs to be on all the time. Because what happens when the computer goes off? Can people access that website? No. See the problem there? Yeah. So this is why you can build a web server on anything, but it doesn't make sense for you to do it on your personal computer because your personal computer is not built to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So <clears throat> the first type of server we've talked about is a web server. And the program that needs to be installed on the computer is uh, uh, um, is Apache. I know I'm repeat, repeating it, repeating it, but um, we all need to uh, make sure that is understood. So are we clear? Mm -hmm. OK. Now. So we all clear about client and server. The, the, the server is the one that's handling the request. The client is the one that's making the request. So when you say, I want to go, let's say on the server, I've installed Apache and then I built a website, imotechtraining.com. Everyone that wants to come to this website, whatever computer you go to that wants to come to this website is the client. And the computer that's serving that request is the server itself. Okay, so what are the various type of servers? Here are the different type of servers you can have. So you have a database server. A database server provides what type of service? A database service. When you go to the uh, DMV, right? And then you have your record, your car registration, who the owner is, right? That's a database server because it's storing inf personal information about you. When you go to MVA, DMV, they just type in, you give them your name, they know that your information is they can pull it up. So we use database servers all the time. Your computer, your phone has a database, your phone book. Why? Why? Because you give somebody's name, you can put the person's number. So you can you can store everyone's information on it, correct? Yeah. You can so even your phone has a, a small database in it, but a database server is a particular server that allows people to access it. Now can when you go to MVA, all those people are staying there. They have their, they have their computers at work, right? Mm -hmm. are, are they all accessing the same server for information? Yeah. yeah. Because when you go there, they'll be working on you. Your case, they're working on somebody else. They're all accessing the same database server. And as they're making changes to it, that information is being stored on that database server. So a database server is a... So what program, what an example of a database server? So Microsoft SQL Server. Once you install this program on your computer, you now have a Microsoft SQL Server. Oracle, this is one of the most popular database is for businesses, Oracle database. And, for, and that's what I, I'm at Oracle database administrator. So this is one of my, this is what I do for a living. So I manage Oracle databases, right? So which means that we set it up, we give access to the right people to access the database and they can do changes to it, right? Another one is MySQL, this is one of the, so these are three examples of a database server. 
Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, right? So you need to install one of these programs into your server to make it become what? A database server. Remember, definition of a server is the hardware, the computer, plus you install a particular program on it, it becomes that, okay? And we've already talked about web server. A web server, it's used for hosting websites. So an example is Apache. So we've already talked about that. Another one is Microsoft ISS, which is part of Microsoft Windows, will allow you to also create a web server. Next, you have what's called a file server. And this is a file server allows you to share files. So a file server means like I would download a file. You, you, you know when you want to um, install a particular program, right? They say click on this link and you start downloading the file and then you can install the file. A file server is that you put files, if it's music, if it's, uh, if it's a document, whatever it is, but we all can log into that server and download it and get the files. Okay. That's a file server. So for a file server, Microsoft Windows Storage Server is an example. So one drive is, yeah. OneDrive is like a, uh, is a file server because you can upload files there. So mail server, a mail server does what? It allows you to get email. You know, when you go to gmail.com, right? Microsoft hotmail.com. All those servers you're accessing are mail servers because you can log in to do what? To send or receive emails. Is this making sense? Yeah. You guys seen how you, you do throughout your days? You interacting with servers all the time. Do you know where the server is? No. Are you managing it? <laughs> no. You just log in, go to that website, and then you log in with your credentials. And it allows you, based on your username and password, to log in. Right? Yep. So uh, a Microsoft Exchange is an example of a mail server. Google, Hotmail, these are all examples, right? But they have to install a particular software called a mail server. Yeah. software. So this is an example, IBM Lotus is an example of a, the software you have to install, Microsoft Exchange Server, Exchange Server. This is the program, this is the software you need to install on your computer to make your computer have become a, you know, you can actually go and buy the, the software and then you can, if you go get the domain name, manage your own emails that are coming and going, oh, wow. you can do that. But it's a lot of work, you know, <laughs> Why do that when you can just go and get a Gmail account, right? right. So, but you can do it. I'm just telling you. Cool. You have also what's called an application server. An application server is an environment to run certain type of application. So you have like web logic, Oracle web logic, Oracle application. So these applications are like uh, you go into a, a, a website or a application, um, a server, and you allow you can run some programs on there. That's an application ser server. Mm -hmm. You can log in and then, you know, let's say you, you can go to that computer and then the computer, that program can do for you like calculations where we all can go in and, and run certain programs. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know those online calculators? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's an application server where you can put in saying what one plus one, it does it for you. The same, another person is, running the same thing. That's an application. That application is doing what? It's doing number calculations for different people. It's managing all our requests at the same time. But it's smart enough to know that you are asking this question, it's answering you, it's answering me. So. So would, would, would something like Priceline be an application server? Exactly. Okay. Because we're going there, we're trying to figure out what price. So that's an, that's an, that could be an example of a application server. And then there's another server that's called DNS, which stands for domain name servers. So the domain name servers, have you guys thought about um, the domain name servers is what handles traffic for us when we're trying to access a website. So think about this. Think about this, right? Imo.com. This one here is, this website is built on what is this built on? What type of web server? web server? 
So this is Amotech web server. This is, we built it here. Another company, google.com, they built their website on their own web server, right? But how do we know when I type imotech.com to send me to this server and not mix up with this server? Who manages that traffic? Who knows what, what the right server to send you if all you have millions and millions or thousands of servers around the world? How do you get sent to the right server? Okay. Right? Yeah. You have some special servers which are known as domain name servers, DNS. And this is a bunch of servers that are all set up around the world that holds information about where to send traffic. So let's say I want to go to, I, I, I built my website on imo.com, right? So here, these domain names, these servers are the servers that's going to have that information. It's going to say, whenever somebody type imo.com, send them to this particular IP address. IP address just means internet protocol. It's like your every computer has like its own. It's like a social security number, for example, mm -hmm. right? So it's gonna say every time somebody types imo.com, send them to this IP to this address. It's like mail. Like their own fingerprint. It's like own fingerprint. So it's like if I send a mail, right? Mm -hmm. I say send it to. 300 Annapolis Road. It's going to say at 300 Annapolis Road, that's the address for anytime somebody wants to imotech.com. Mm -hmm. And then Google, it will say Google is at 400 Annapolis Road. So this computer, these DNS servers, their job is to just store information. If somebody type this address, send them to the, it's like a traffic police. These are the DNS servers, domain name servers. So I have imo.com. These servers will say anytime somebody types imo.com, it has an IP address for the server that has my website. It will send you directly there. So this is what these DNS servers do. Okay, and these these are being these are being managed by like big organizations around the world. These DNS servers. But again, it's good for you guys to know. Uh, um, what a DNS server is. Share, let me share my screen again. Okay, so this is what a DNS server is. So what's the key difference between a server and a PC? Because now we've talked, we talked about PC before, right? And I told you guys, a PC is made for use. your personal use, right? A server, so this is the difference. <laughs> the server is like this big truck compared to a PC, which is like this small car. If these two guys hit each other, who's going to destroy who? The server. So the server is the heavy lifter. So a server offer high reliability and dependability features that just are not available on the desktop. These servers are expensive. Servers can be very expensive because of what they what their capabilities are. A PC has to be cheap because you use it for your own personal use, right? Only you are using it at the, time, at the same time. Some of these servers, how many millions or thousands of people are using it at one time? Wow. Now, each computer has, has what? Computers are made up of what? What are the three parts? Key, three key parts of a computer. Hard drive, Hard drive Hard RAM, RAM, and processor, processor right? Your PC, it's gonna have a small hard drive, small RAM, small processor because it's only handling the request you are making. It's like horsepower. Yeah. Now, for a server that has to manage 1,000 requests at one time, how many gigs of RAM, how many, how fast is the processor, all of this because it's managing all of these requests. If you don't have those things, it's gonna crash, right? Mm -hmm. So they can be very, servers can be very, very expensive. And a server has to be, strong. Some servers can go on for three, four, five, six years without ever going off. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So these servers have to, they have to do that. They have to go for sometimes for years without ever, uh, ever going down. Now, that's why I said it's not a good idea to have your, uh, 
your your server on your PC because when your PC your PC is not made for that, okay. So since your PC is not made for that, that's going to be an issue. Now, uh, performance, and let me let me give you guys some key differences between how a server how servers are built. So a server will be built like this. Uh, share. A server will be built like this. So your PC, this is your PC, your personal computer. How many battery pack, how many um, battery does it have? I mean, power bank does it have? So your PC has a power bank, right? So it has one power bank, right? How many hard drive comes with most? One. Hard drive, it has one, right? One. And uh, how many uh, RAM, maybe one or two, right? Mm -hmm. So you may have one or two gram. So this is two gig of RAM two gig of RAM, right? Mm -hmm. So now your computer is on for, for a long time. And something happens to the power bank. Everything, Everything goes off, right? See that, you see that problem? Mm -hmm. Now, here's how a server servers are built. Power bank, you have one, I have at least two. Two power bank. So if something goes wrong with this, this one, you can use it. Why you replace this one that's gone bad, right? Hard drive, it will allow, it will give you slots for many hard drives. So they say one terabyte, two terabyte, three terabyte, right? So if something happens with this, it still can keep working while you fix that. And RAM will give you a lot of RAM. And all of these, and you can keep adding, let's say you want more, you can keep adding to a server and where you, you know, you limited slots in a PC. See, so they're not made for the same thing. These things are made to be on 24 hours a day, years, years, years. And if something goes wrong, because machine, anything can break. They give you extra, if something goes wrong, it can still be on while you fix the other one. So this is one of the key things between the servers. A server is made for the hefty, heavy lifting, the truck, where your car is just made for you to move around and see the difference. Mm -hmm. So be mindful of that. Okay. Uh, so that's one of the key things between see. So again, server offer high reliability, dependability features that just are not available in your PC. Servers have proven performance advantages over PC, right? Mm -hmm. Like I showed you guys. And servers help improve productivity. It also helps to reduce operating expense and also lowers maintenance costs. Why is that? Because not a lot of issues come because they have all the reserves. No, that's more on performance. Oh, okay. And this. I'll show you why. Let's give let me give you guys an example. Let me give you guys an example. Right? Let's say we all work for uh, the motor vehicle. MVA, the Motor Vehicle Administration, right? And we register in cars, right? Right? Yeah. And we have to keep registering cars that are coming in, right? Let's say we're doing it on PC. So what's PC? PC means that each one of us, this is computer one, computer two, computer three, right? When people come to the office, let's say the first person comes here, right? Where is my information being stored on this computer, right? What happens if this person wants to access that computer, that information that you just did on work on yesterday? You have to email it to or send them to them, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, with a server, they're all it becomes it server. becomes difficult because to manage all the information is going in and out. Yeah. Right. So if you need, if let's say we all need some records, we need some data in our computers for us to do our work. And our data, <laughs> the data we need is one terabyte. One TB. If I'm going to install one, how many terabyte do I need to put on? on um, do I need to buy for these three workers to have the same information? Three terabyte. See, it's become expensive. I need to put one terabyte here to download this information for him. One terabyte here to download this information for her. One terabyte to download that information for that person. Right? It's expensive. It's not efficient. What happens when this computer breaks? We're in trouble. But here's the thing. A server, you only need, you can put one terabyte on this server and we all 
can access, can access the information from that server. We just log in and it will give us that and it's centralized. So if this guy has issue with the computer, the information is here. If I'm in, entering information for all, for a particular person, it's in the server, I can access it. So not only is it reliable, it's cheaper, it makes work more efficient. This is how servers work. Think about it, YouTube is a server. What do we do? We have one location where all of us can go post our videos. And then all you do is go to YouTube and we can access it because we are accessing it from the YouTube servers. Imagine if all of us have it on our computer, how it's, so you see, we interact with servers every day. This is what they're made for. Efficiency, it makes our lives easier. Does that make sense? Any question? So that's the point. So you 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 work with computers, you start to see that, you know, you interact with them, but you don't know because you're not you're using it. But now that you guys are learning IT stuff, you start seeing how certain things work. And you use servers every day. If you go most of the time, if you go on the internet, you're interacting with a server. Some type of server. Okay. So these are the key things about servers. They're reliable and dependable because they're built to be strong. Mm -hmm. they, they have better performance because you put more RAM, more horsepower, more things into them to handle all the requests that are coming in. And then also they help productivity, they help reduce operating expenses, and they help you run your company better because instead of installing everything on each person's PC, just install it on a server and let them connect to that server and all your people can work and it costs, it saves you a lot of money, okay? So these are examples of what a server, a data center look like. So when you go, when you access in um, YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. When you access in YouTube, this is what a YouTube, YouTube looks like. And this thing keeps dropping. So this is what like a YouTube data center looks like. So it's a lot of servers working together. Uh, and here's the cool thing. These are all individual servers, right? But you can, you can do what's called horizontal scaling with servers. What do I mean by that? Horizontal, there are two types of scaling. There's horizontal scaling, there's vertical scaling. Uh, so what do I mean by, the, when you talk about scaling, right? So this is your PC, right? So you go and buy your computer. Your computer, maybe the manufacturer says it comes with four gig of RAM, but can go up to 16 gig of RAM, right? The hard drive, they say it can go up to, it comes with 500 gig, but it can go up to two terabytes, right? So that's your hard drive. This is your processor RAM and your processor is Pentium, let's say it's i7. This is a pretty good computer, yeah. which means if I go and buy a hard drive, there's two terabytes, I can swap it okay. with this one, right? But if I go and buy a, 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 a hard drive that's four terabyte, how much can I use? Okay. Only two. So that's what's called a vertical, which means you take the same machine, you try to add to make it as powerful as you can. It's like an upgrade. So it came with four gig of RAM, but I'm like, this is not good enough. I can go buy a 16 gig of RAM and put it here. But if I go buy 32 gig of RAM, guess what? Nothing. Have you guys gone and bought those external flash card? Um, right? You can do that, but again, it's not, it's outside of the computer, but this is when you go put, okay? And uh, sometimes you buy, like some of you got your cell phones. And uh, if you have Samsung or these phones, they say you can add external, you can add a external drive up to 64 gig. Like the SD card. SD card. Yeah. You can say, it would say up to, manages up to 64 gig, right? If you go buy 124 gig of SD card, it's only going to use 64. So the other one, because that's the max this computer can take. See? So the thing about vertical scaling is once you hit the peak, you cannot do anything. So with servers though, you can do what's called vertical. I mean, um, horizontal. Vertical means you can upgrade your hardware. Mm -hmm. 
but there's a limit. Horizontal means they work together. Horizontal means, let's say I have a server here, and this server has one terabyte of hard drive, right? It has four core CPU, the processor is what they call, right? Four core CPU, right? Then it has 32 gig of RAM processor, right? Okay. Let's say now, I'm on Let's say I'm running out of space, right? I, my business is booming and people, my customers are using my, my server, right? And all of a sudden this server is full, right? Guess what I can do? I can go buy another server, two terabyte, eight CPU and 64, right? And guess what? I can join them and these two now become and you can keep doing that. And you can keep adding as more. Think about YouTube. How many videos are being uploaded every time? Yeah. So YouTube, what they do, they just keep buying servers and those servers, they scale horizontally. Horizontally means you're adding new machines to what you have to make it more powerful. You can do that with servers. Does that make sense? So this is what, if you look here, if you look here, if you look at this picture, each one of these are individual servers. These are these are rack servers. See how they all stack? Yeah. This is a server. This is, and you can just keep adding them. So this is like hundreds of thousands of servers working together, and they can scale up. They all become. They can just keep growing. So this is an example of what a data center look like. Like this can be a Google data center, you can be a Microsoft data center. When you're using Gmail, these are the kind of servers that are handling your, your stuff. So this is what uh, those servers look like in, in real life for big companies. Okay, so what I want us to do is, we're going to, uh, we're going to build, I'm gonna use AWS. And I'm going to show you quickly how I can build a website. A web, I can start a web server and build a simple website from a server. So this class is going to be, we're going to be doing an Amazon Web Services. So remember I told you guys, it's very, very expensive. It's very, very expensive to have what? For these servers, they'll cost you a lot of money, right? So they'll cost you a lot of money. Some companies will need that. So if you are, building a web, uh, uh, like say you, you're gonna build your own Amazon website where you, people can come and buy things from you, right? And you, you're expecting that if things go well, you're gonna have thousands of customers every day accessing your, your web server, right? Are you gonna buy a small server? Or are you gonna start with a big server that can, as you grow, yeah. right? So you're gonna buy a big server that, because you expect as you grow, people to come in, right? Mm -hmm. You don't wanna go buy a small server and as your business starts to go, it's gonna crash. Now you have to go buy another server. So you're gonna spend a lot of money up front. So company will spend 500,000, a million dollars to buy big servers. And you can build the best website, but nobody comes to it. Now you've lost a lot of money. So one of the things about Amazon and the cloud, you can start small and as your business go, you can, you can add to it. And you don't have to pay for a lot of upfront. You just pay for every month what you use, mm -hmm. right? So this is what allows companies, the little guy to now compete with the big companies. Before, this is why like IT is making so many millionaires because that little, that guy in Africa, that guy in India who has an idea to build an app, who has an idea to build a company which for a small amount of money can, can go to AWS and rent a small server, build on it, let customers use it. And as they grow, they grow. Where before, you need to spend like $500,000, a million dollars. You don't have the money. You have an idea, but you don't have the money. So this is what IT is becoming. It's transforming the cloud technologies, allowing the little guys to compete with the big guys. And it's even also allowing the big guys 
to also save money and do things that they, 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 they can't do. It's allowing countries that, are, that they don't have the infrastructure. Think about it. If you have a server at your house, let's say you go buy a server. There's a lot of work that goes into building a server. Let me, let, let's think about this, right? There's a lot of work that goes to you thinking about a server. So for you to have a server, what do you need first? You need to server, right? You need a server. And what else do you need for that server to be on? Power. But no, no, no. You're putting this in your house. Okay. Electricity. And what else do you need for that server? For people to access it, what does it need to be? You need internet access, right? What happens if your internet goes down? Can people access your website? No. What happens if you're like, if, uh, yeah, you need cooling too, because sometimes they get hot, so you need AC, but that's all, we can put that as electricity because if your AC is cranked up, all of these, right? What happens if power goes out? There's a storm and the power goes out. What happens? People can access your server. What happens if somebody's driving drunk and hit the pole, they have the internet? You see all these problems that you can gain even from companies that have the servers on their premises? But with the AWS, the way these cloud services, the way they built, you just build it that you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. You don't have to worry about internet access. You don't have to worry about electricity. They manage all of that because you're using their server. They've built an infrastructure where you can do all of this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna demo quickly, like, and also it allows you to build fast. Because before, if you wanna build a web server, what do you have to do? You have to go buy the server. You have to set up the network, internet access. You have to configure it. It takes, it will take months to years to set up the whole thing. But with AWS now with this cloud services in like five to 10 minutes, you can have a website up. And I'm gonna show you guys. So I'm gonna do this demo and then this will be um, the, this will be our end of our intro and I will post this um, recording. So, so here is what we're gonna do. So, um, so let's build it. So what I'm gonna do, I have an account already, AWS account. So I'm gonna log in to my AWS account. So, uh, So I go to AWS.com. So I'm gonna log into my so let me go in next. So I'm gonna put my password and uh Gonna put my security. And that's one thing, they're very secure. So, uh, okay, so I've logged in, right? So let's say I wanna build a website. It's gonna be a very basic website, but so how what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take one of these services, EC2 instance. This EC2 instance is, is a server. I'm gonna borrow a server from AWS, right? So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna to go to instances and I'm gonna tell them what I want. So let's say I'm starting small. I'm just gonna build, right? So I'm gonna say launch an instance. Launch an instance just means I'm gonna start a server. So I'm gonna launch an instance. Uh, where am I launching? This is in Ohio, so let me go. And you see another thing is you can pick where in the country you wanna this service to be. You can see here, there's one, there's some servers, they have a data center in Northern Virginia. They have another one in Ohio, in California and Oregon. These are all in US. They have some data centers in South Africa. So let's say you wanna build this in Africa. They have it in Asia Pacific, they have in Canada, Europe. So they have data centers all around the world, right? So I'm gonna pick Northern Virginia. This is the area where I wanna launch my instance, right? So now is, all I'm gonna say is, I'm gonna tell them that what's, I'm gonna take the server that I wanna borrow, right? So let's say I have an idea, I want a website, I'm gonna make, create a website. So here, remember, every computer must have an operating system, correct? Mm -hmm. So you see here, these are the different type of, you see Microsoft server, 
So the server has needs an operating system. But I told you guys, Linux is a very stable operating system. Linux is another one, right? We talk about Microsoft, we talk about iOS, we talk about Mac. I mean, iOS is Mac, right? And we talked about Windows. So here, you see, they give me option of the operating system that I want to be installed on my server. So for now, I'm just gonna select this one, this Linux one. And here, you can decide how much RAM and processor you want on the server I'm gonna borrow. Remember I told you guys, when you get in a server or computer, the things you wanna pay attention to, how much RAM, processor, and, and CPU, hard drive, right? And hard drive, those are the things. So here, when you go there, you have to tell them, you can tell them what you want. So you can select, you see this one? I'm doing the free one because they also, by the way, you once you have an account with Amazon, they will allow you to have free. You can use free ones for like a whole year. You don't they don't charge you for it. So they give you a lot of free stuff because they want people to be to get into it. So you see this free tier one is what I'm gonna use. And look at this: the server I'm gonna get is gonna give me one virtual CPU. It's also gonna give me one gig of RAM. So this way I can select, right? Next. What is going to just do information about uh, um, the server, what I want, how I want the server to perform and all of these things. And here you see, I can tell it how many servers do I want to launch? Just one? Or do I want to do two, three, four, five? I can decide how many of those servers that I want to, I want to start. But for now, since it's free, I'm just going to start one. So I've picked before what? I picked the CPU and the RAM, right? Yeah. Now you can pick how much gig of hard drive, permanent storage you want. So by default, it give me eight. If I want a hundred gig, I can pick as much as I want here, but I'm gonna leave it at eight because what I'm doing is not big. I don't need that lot of space. But you see that? And guess what? I can add more space if I want. Let's say I want, yeah. I can keep adding as many as I want, you know? Cool. But for this one, I'm just gonna keep the basic one, okay? So I'm gonna go to review. And, and basically it's telling me the this server I'm gonna launch is gonna have one CPU, it's gonna have one gig of RAM, and it tells me what um instance type is telling me Security group, security means like it allows, security allows you to see who, what, what kind of things people can, can, can do. Anyway, we'll talk more about this, but ignore this. This is some security stuff. But what I basically do, just did is I'm going to, I'm going to launch this instance. So all I've done is right now, in less than five minutes, I've launched an instance, which means that Amazon is giving me a server. See, they've given me a server. So this server is now running. So you can see here, you guys can see here that a server is running. Okay, now this is just a basic server. I haven't done anything yet. You see here, it tells me that this server is running. It's giving me information about this server. Remember I told you guys, every server has its own IP address. This IP address, once your server has this, no other server in the world is gonna have that IP address. Only this one is having it. It's like your own private address, right? So, but, Remember what I told you guys, what makes a server? The hardware plus a particular pro program, right? So now all I have is a server, but I don't know what server I want it to be. I just have the hardware. So the next thing is I need to install a program on it, correct? Mm -hmm. So, but I want to build a website. So what type of server do I need to create? A web server, right? So, um, so here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to show you two things. I'm going to log into my server. Again, this part, don't worry about it because you guys are not, um, So all I all I've done is So here's what happens, right? Here, this server here is giving me information about the server that's on in on Amazon, one of the location. I don't know where in the Northern Virginia somewhere. So this just shows me that the server is up. But now I'm actually, this is Linux. I've actually logged into that computer, that Linux. This is Linux, the thing about Linux is it's black and white. It's not like Windows. It's a black and white um, server. So you can see here that right now what I've done is I've just logged into, I'm actually inside that server right now, right? But, so you can see here, if I'm, I'm gonna give you guys this IP, I'm gonna put this on the chat. So this is the IP address. If you guys go to this, this is gonna be where my website is going to be. So let me copy this and I'm gonna put this on the chat. So you guys can, on your computer, you can go there to everyone, that's the IP address, 54.235.1.22, okay? Now, on this next screen, I'm gonna put that IP address in there. And you see, it's blank, nothing happens. Because I haven't set the, because what am I going to? Uh, what do you need to go to a website? You need to open to a browser, right? So it's not a web browser yet. Right? So you see that when I go there, nothing happens, right? But here, I'm gonna run some programs. So here's what I'm gonna do. So you guys are gonna see that uh, I'm gonna create something easy, right? So the first thing you wanna do is, every time you have a server or every time you have a computer, what's the first thing you wanna do? You wanna run some security updates, right? So Linux is what's called a command line. It's not like Windows where you click on, you click on, on cl and it opens, right? Yeah. Linux means you use command line. So the people that do this are called Linux admin, but Linux is very, very, it's a very stable operating system. Sometimes you open Microsoft and what happens? Your computer will start to just hang and you have to restart it, right? Mm -hmm. Microsoft is not always very stable, but Linux is very, very stable. So what, every time you have a computer, the first thing you wanna do is one update for security. So this is the command I'm running. So, so you see what I'm doing, yum update is I'm checking to run an update. So it says the up, update, my computer is up to date. And then next what I'm gonna do, here's the key thing, I'm gonna install what? Remember I told you guys for you to have a web server, what do you need to install? Apache, right? So Apache is this program called HTTPD. So you see the command here, yum, install this program called Apache. The why means just do it, don't ask me any questions. Because if you don't put the why, it's gonna ask you, are you sure you wanna install this? Okay. Well, the why means just install it. So what I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna install the software. Now, this is the software I need to install to make this become what? A web server. And you can see now it's installing the web server, right? Now, the server has been installed. The software has been installed, but for the software to be installed, what do you need to do? You also need to start the program. Just installing, you see, remember, I've installed a program, right? This command up here, I've installed a program. 
but the program is not running. So if it's not running, even if I go back here and refresh, nothing is gonna show. See, it's still gonna say nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So what do I need to do? I need to start the program. Mm -hmm. So this is the command to start the program. So right now the program has been started and watch. Once I click here, you see, it's now shown a web page. Mm -hmm. I've now made this server a web server, right? But this is just like a blank server, it's not, right? So now I'm gonna build a simple website. So I'm just to save time, I'm just gonna copy this whole thing. And I'm gonna, you guys are gonna see that I'm, I'm gonna now create a simple website. Watch before what happened. See that? Watch when I refresh. Yeah, I just build a website said, hi, this is Coleta. <clears throat> and if any one of you go to this, if I give you guys this link, the link that I gave you, just type it on your browser, 54.235.1.2, it's gonna bring you to this website. It's a simple website, but what I've just done is built a website in a few minutes. In this on a server that doesn't belong to me. It's a server that belongs to Amazon. I can rent this. And this server can be up as long as I as long as I want it to be. So if you guys go to 54.235.1.22, it will take you to that website. So you're now I have a server that's running 100 percent And this one, I don't have to worry about it. So if I wanted to build a nice website, I can build a nice website here and I can attach this and I can give it, I can go buy a domain name, like yeah. IMO, MohammedForFana.com or something like that. And I can attach it with this. Even when you type that name, it will take you to the server. So what? So up there where it says, when you go back to it, up there next to it, it says not secure. It's not secure because it's not HTTP. Now, it's yeah, it's not HTTP. It's a H, if you watch. It's HTT. Okay. So there's some other things you have to do to make your website secure. Okay. I haven't done that because it's just a basic yeah, website. Yeah. Okay. But usually there's some, if you're a web developer, you know how to do all of those things to, to set it up. But this class is not, this session is just for you guys to understand what a server is and how it works. But literally, I've just built a web server that you guys can, can go into. And if I want, I can stop at any time. And if I stop the server here, you guys go there, it won't show anything. So again, from here, I can just go to instance type and I can stop that instance. I can turn off the server, it's like turning off the server, right? So now the server is stopped. And if you go, if you, if I refresh this page, nothing is gonna show because I've stopped the server. See how it's hanging? Yeah. Yeah, but now, if I go and say, and now I'm gonna start the server. The only thing is, the only, the only difference is when I start it again, the IP address is gonna change. That's one of the only thing when you restart it, but uh, as those that are gonna be taking AWS class will get more into why the IP address change. Remember that IP address is unique to only that instance. Okay, so each instance is gonna be fingerprinted. It's the IP, will, you see right now it says it's in stop stage, right? So if I go here, action, Start the instance. I'm gonna start the instance again. Yeah, I'll give you some. I'll, I'll give you some things you can you can uh, you guys can go to um, that will help with as far as uh, see now it's running again, right? Mm -hmm. But now the IP address is gonna be the I, I just I gave you it's gonna change because I stopped and started. So I'm gonna give you a different IP, but it's the same exact thing that you will see the same page that I gave you guys earlier because that page is, is being installed on the um, on the server. 
So the IP address now is 50. This is the new IP address because I restarted it. But because, but it, mind you, once I've done this, if I, this server can be on for the whole year, it won't go off. But because I, I stopped it, it went back because the server is the same and just the IP has changed because I stopped it. But see that? Hi, this is our letter. So uh, that being said, I'm gonna now terminate. And this is as easy as it is. Terminate means I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't need this server anymore. I'm gonna give it back to them. So this is just a demo. I'm going to just come back in here and I'm going to terminate it. Stop means just stop, but I still own it. Yeah. I'm still using it. Terminate means done. I'm done with it. I'm going to delete everything and take it back. So if I click here and I can just go to instance state and say terminate instance. And now I'm giving it up. So now um, it's being terminated. So uh, that is all I have. You see how it kicked me out when I terminate it kicked me out of the server because it says um because it stopped it so um yeah any questions so um i will once this video is available i will upload it on youtube and i will i'll send it to you guys on the on the link, uh, wherever you register, wherever you came through, I'll post it there for you guys to watch. But basically, this is this is it. Um, next week, uh, there's gonna be uh, a conference on technology. I'm one of the speakers is for um, IT. Um, I'll give more instructions. So if anyone is interested in taking the AWS course, just send send a message or um, and we'll go from there. Okay? So any questions? All right, folks. Well, thank you very much for your time and uh, have a blessed rest of the weekend. And um, if you don't have any question, that is it. Thank you, Prof.